this leadership and energy will now environmental be design. Um, the BOMA Best, uh, Building Owners Management Association Building Environment Standards, uh, the Well Building, and uh, the Passive House uh, Standard. So keep those in mind because we're now, I'm going to now switch. We're going to come back to them. So you're not leave, leaving them forever, but we're going to now um, have a, a, a look at what I mean when I say holistically looking at uh, indoor air quality. So next slide. Okay, so building environment, we, um, I'm an occupational environmental hygienist, and we, there's a few ways that a person can approach hazardous or um, uh, well health in, uh, in occupational settings, which of course office buildings are. And, um, but we tend to sometimes think of it as a thing, like there's a substance or there's one set of circumstances and that's not actually the case so the building environment let's go to the next slide is uh impacted by all of these other aspects uh the outdoor air quality air movement within the building uh what kind of mechanical system uh is in place or sometimes it's actually natural ventilation uh, the materials furnishing products that are brought into the space, and of course, the occupants themselves. So next slide. And of course, these are interacting with each other as well. So to, in, uh, I'm not gonna be able to cover outdoor air quality uh, today uh, for time, but uh, let's not forget that that is part of the paradigm. So uh, let's go to the next slide. So I'm going to start with this concept of air movement within a building uh, and uh, mechanical ventilation if it's uh, uh, present. So next slide. Okay, so um, this is a schematic of uh, an air handling system, uh, HVAC system, and it's important to um, get the concepts of how an air handling system works. So um, I believe the next slide, yeah, uh, is going to give us an arrow. So where that arrow is, you'll see, is pointing towards the air intake. Uh, air intakes have filters on them. Uh, the filters are to keep birds and rodents and various and sundry things out of the next important part of the HVAC system, which is the cooling coil, which takes humidity out of the air, the heating coil, which heats it back up to um, temper it to, for it to be comfortable, a fan to distribute it through the, um, uh, either the plenum or through the uh, supply air duct. Uh, that air is then delivered into uh, individual buildings. There's either an active or a passive external um, return air. And the next slide is then that air is either recirculated in some cases or exhausted depending on the system. Now, so this is in fact the biggest energy suck in the entire building. Uh, and so there's been a lot of interest in being able to modify this system uh, using the uh, sustainable building principles and cutting back on use of uh, fuel and electricity and things like that. So we still need to understand how this works though, because this is central to um, how air moves around in a building. So next slide. In a, a big building, in a, like in an office tower, you'll see that we balance the um, negative and positive pressures within the building. Um, all buildings will have an exhaust fan. Regardless of anything else, they're going to have an exhaust fan because um, they they have to um, um, exhaust um, from the sanitary vents and things like that. And so that uh, if the building is properly balanced, uh, it will be neutral. But if you only have an exhaust fan, you're going to have severe negative pressure, uh, which means that you've got uncontrolled air movement from the outside uh, into the inside of the building. So next slide. So how we deal with that is to uh, provide makeup air or 
uh, supply ventilation air to balance the amount of air that we are exhausting. And now you see that we don't have that uncontrolled air that's either trying to move through the uh, envelope of the building or around the windows or uh, even worse, up from the parking garage, uh, which could not only bring with it carbon monoxide from the parking garage, but depending on where the building is sited, also radon and other things that we don't want to have in the uh, occupied space. So that um, uh, being able to balance that pressure is very important in a building design. Now, this is your multiple um, kind of building, typical office uh, tower kind of building. Uh, if we go to the next slide, Next slide. Yeah, there we go. Um, is even on a small scale. So this would be a, a single unit house, um, maybe one or two stories, whatever. But you still, the air is always going to move within that building because you're always going to have a positive and, and a negative pressure um, situation. Uh, could be by heating the air that the heated air is going to rise. Uh, if you've got um, attics and things like that, um, then you've got uh, the um, uh, differential in pressure in, uh, sorry, temperature uh, between the attic and the uh, occupied space. So air is always going to move in, within the building, either in a controlled manner or an uncontrolled manner. And so this is where it gets interesting when we start looking at some of the uh, sustainable building designs, because of course we're tr they are trying to cut back on the amount of energy required to move the air around. So in our next slide, you'll see a design that is often used in sustainable buildings. So that central tower with the arrows pointing up is a solar chimney, or often it looks like an atrium, but what it is acting as, as, as a solar chimney. And so that heated air is rising. Uh, the makeup air is coming in from uh, ground level or uh, windows that are uh, potentially in the um, uh, envelope of the building. But one of the, one of the uh, challenges, so this is one of our first challenges that we want to uh, consider in a sustainable building design, is that um, that air is coming in at a very low flow. It's uh, uh, often used uh, with just as a displacement ventilation. In displacement ventilation, you've got low flow air coming in, and then you're making use of the people in the building that are the little heaters. Like each of us are a little 37 degree uh, heater. Uh, we've all got computers on our desks in front of us, they be creating heat. And so that will allow that low flow, low velocity air to heat up just because of the occupants and um, computers and things. And that will induce the airflow that the air is then eventually uh, taken out through the, through the stack. So the challenge with that, it's not a bad idea, but the challenge with that idea is that because of the low velocity that it's almost impossible to design good filtration on that kind of design. Uh, and so I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, the other challenge around that is the, just the physics of how air moves. So in this illustration on the left-hand side of the slide, you have an upwind velocity profile. So that's just your air moving, uh, moving up against the building. Here in Vancouver, that's actually quite predictable uh, because we, of our proximity to the ocean, we have a pretty predictable onshore offshore movement that happens on a daily basis. Uh, that's why Vancouver has the, um, uh, is able to clean our air of automobile exhaust, and it all ends up out in the Fraser Valley because of that onshore offshore movement that happens every day. So air, wind, however you want to uh, term it, 
air is going to move across the building, and out of that movement of air, you're going to get uh, turbulence. And so the turbulence is you've got streamlines going up and over the building. Um, we've got um, air that's impacting the building directly. And then we've got, you can see turbulence down at the bottom of the, of the building on the upwind uh, side. And now that cloud illustration, which is on the right-hand side of the building, is what we call the recirculation zone. And so the air, you've got the streamlines coming up and over the building, and all buildings have some kind of exhaust. I mentioned that already, uh, even if it's just sanitary vents that are coming up. And so in that recirculation zone or turbulence, that's created on the um, um, uh, downwind side of the building, we entrain air that is either, you know, containing things from whatever the exhaust was, or, um, or if we have many buildings like we would in downtown Vancouver, downtown Toronto, is that we can be entraining the exhaust from uh, other buildings as well. So this is just physics, right? You know, it's um, we have to take that into uh, consideration when we're thinking about how we're designing the buildings because that's going to affect what comes back into the building every time you open the door or whatever uh, um, source of air uh, you've got. And again, in an it can sometimes be in an uncontrolled fashion. So next slide. So this is a, a very, very typical illustration of how we get around in a sustainable building, how we get around um, cutting back on the mechanical ventilation system, i.e. open plan offices. And I think you've all seen this, uh, this setup. And it's... Um, the setup is good for light. You can see that uh, people, in fact, these the next couple of photos are taken from a study that I did. Um, and people are pretty happy with being able to not be stuck in an interior office and not being able to see the uh, light and that kind of thing. Um, but they tend to be very unhappy with the uh, amount of uh, acoustic um, contamination in that kind of setting. And so the next slide, again, is just an, uh, another picture of an open plan um, boardroom. So we've got light, uh, but bad acoustics, and we have to figure out how the air is gonna move within this building, because most buildings are built uh, as, specul uh, as speculation, and then people move in furniture and uh, these dividers and things like that, and that, in fact, impacts the way the air moves uh, in the building. So this next uh, slide is just a way of um, when we were looking at these open plan offices, is each of those areas that have the red zone signs on them will be impacted by the way those um, partitions are set up and where the air is coming from and the uh, important aspect here is that we require fresh air to dilute whatever pollutants are being created within our environment. And when we have these very complex um, uh, airflow patterns, because we put up uh, barriers in different ways, that's going to um, uh, compromise uh, the, the clean dilution flow of the air. So next slide is that in addition to that natural air movement, just the physics of the air movement, uh, the potential that we might have an HVAC system, a mechanical system moving air around, is that no building is entire to itself. It's going to have occupants uh, coming into the building. And so I want to just uh, illustrate in the next slide so this is a tracing of uh, carbon dioxide, and uh, this is a naturally ventilated building. 
And if you can see the tracing uh, early in the morning on the left-hand side of the, uh, the graph, uh, starts at about 500 um, parts per million carbon dioxide. And as occupants come into the building, we get a very, very sharp rise in carbon dioxide. Um, people are breathing. Uh, they're known for that. And um, as uh, things change during the day, you either uh, people exit the building, you might get a little bit of a, a dip. Um, and uh, if you've got a, um, uh, more people coming into the building, perhaps for a meeting, uh, you get another uh, peak and th so on and so forth throughout the day. And eventually people leave at the end of the day and you get a, um, uh, a washout of the, uh, the carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is a surrogate, okay? I'm not claiming that carbon dioxide is in, so, is in and of itself hazardous, but it is a wonderful surrogate because it tells us something about the amount of dilution ventilation that's happening in that space. And uh, that dilution ventilation can be calculated to even in a naturally ventilated space, determine how much the dilution ventilation uh, is in that space. So let's go to the next slide. So this slide is, um, is I think the important slide for today. Um, I, I thought uh, I, when I originally started to put this um, uh, talk together, it was pre-COVID-19 uh, lockdown. And so as I uh, thought about what I wanted to talk about today, I thought, eh, let's just go for it. So why do we need dilution ventilation? Well, we need it not only to dilute the um, natural um, um, things like emissions from, uh, from furniture, from uh, flooring, from you know, various and sundry things that we bring into the building, we need dilution ventilation because each one of us is exhaling carbon dioxide and also pheromones, um, body odor, perfumes. Uh, we bring a lot of things in with us as humans. And because we know that the amount of dilution ventilation is directly related to uh, the spread of infectious disease within uh, a space. So uh, this equation uh, is the stripped down version of what's called the Wells-Riley equation. Uh, Wells-Riley uh, were working back in the 40s and uh, um, they were very actually clever in that they, act, they used like guinea pigs uh, to, uh, to in the uh, uh, exhaust ventilation ducts uh, to, to prove that um, airborne particulate matter of an infectious nature can be spread in a building. So we are gifted with this equation out of those experiments way back when. And what it tells us is that the number of new infections, C, is equal to the number of susceptible persons in the exposed environment, S, and what we have in the exponential uh, term is uh, the quanta, which is the infectivity of the, the, the substance. We have um, a respiration rate per occupant. Uh, we have a time that the occupant is in the space. And that Q, the Q is the important one here. That is the airflow. And that dilution airflow is going to uh, govern the amount of um, uh, co the concentration of infectious particulate matter that is uh, remains in the space. So our little uh, sneezing man there um, is what everybody is completely uh, concerned with these days with COVID and um, walking through that cloud if you uh, are entering a bus or being a bus driver and having uh, somebody sneeze on you or cough on you. So e even before uh, the SARS-CoV-2, which is the name of the organism, which causes the disease, COVID-19, uh, we've had, we know that we have other airborne infectious agents, for example, measles 
or mycobacterium tuberculosis. So it's not new that infectious particulate can have um, can be present in the environment, and the dilution ventilation is the most important part of the equation that helps control that uh, infectious particulate matter. So going to the next slide, this is, um, I think, a very sobering way of looking at it. So uh, if the larger particulate matter, so you know, think about um, when, you, when you cough or sneeze and, uh, or you moistly speak, uh, that's, fairly, that's fairly large particles. And so they will fall quite quickly uh, through the air, and they will also tend to um, lodge up in the nose and the upper airways. However, once that particulate matter is um, distributed in air, and depending on what the relative humidity of the air is, those little droplets of respiratory secretions, which have mucus and uh, some saline and uh, various and sundry um, components to those drop droplets and potentially the infectious particulate matter, um, will evaporate and they evaporate quite quickly. And so the evaporated diameter is becomes very, very small. And so when we're looking at, um, we tend to not see naked uh, viruses floating around for very long, um, but a virus is around uh, 0 0.01 to 0 0.1 micron, depending. Um, and so we see that as the droplets of air, which in fact, oh, sorry, droplets of um, respiratory secretion, which protect, tend to protect the organism from outside air in, um um, the relative humidity and other things that are happening in the space, those tiny particle, uh, particles can remain suspended for quite a long time. So in the early days of um, this outbreak, there was the uh, debate of whether it's droplet spread. Droplet would be those 100 micron to 40 micron droplets. They, they fall quite quickly. They're the ones that... Um, coat services or coat your hands. And so then you, you know, open the door and now uh, everything uh, that you touch is contaminated. But we now know that uh, it's also airborne spread and airborne spread from people who are um, asymptomatic. And those tiny particles are the ones that remain uh, suspended in air. And those are the ones that we worry about. And those are the ones that we care about um, the uh, airflow in uh, the space that we're in. So next slide. Okay, so this is a, um, uh, a smoke generating tube that we're using. It's a little bit easier to see the illustration on the right than the left, but um, I'm gonna start with the one on the, on the left. If you can visualize that uh, there's a door, it's purple and a person's hand holding a smoke generator, and then there's smoke that's going up, just straight up. Now, what's a little bit um, interesting to visualize is that that space that is traversing, that's just above the door there, is open. It's completely open. And so uh, it's not a window. It's, it's just a big open space. And so as you can see, if you look all the way up to the top of that uh, of that photo, you can still see the smoke. It's the smoke is moving absolutely straight up, i.e., there's no air movement. If there's no air movement, there's no dilution ventilation happening. So this uh, these two photos were taken in a uh, very lovely sustainable building uh, design that had no ventilation. Um, the uh, the uh, illustration on the right is just a little bit easier to see. It's a smoke tube. And uh, again, we're seeing that there's absolutely no uh, pressure differential uh, through that door jam. So that means that, you know, any of that particulate, uh, if potentially partic uh, infectious particulate matter being generated, it's not going anywhere. Okay, so I, I, I'm trying to get you to visualize what happens if we don't if we don't move the air around. Okay, now we've got more things to talk about, so let's go to the next slide. 
Okay, so I mentioned that we also bring things into the building. So the designers of the building, the architects, um, you know, have these beautiful designs um, in any of the sustainable building um, um, certification schemes. You get all kinds of um, uh, points for using low emission uh, materials in your building, which is a really good thing that they do that. Uh, but once the building is turned over to the owner or turned over to the occupants, all of that information is often lost. And so unless we know how to use a sustainable building, we're going to ask for trouble. So this next aspect is we bring in new furniture, we bring in new floor coverings, we paint the building, uh, we're doing um, all kinds of uh, uh, office machines, uh, photocopiers, and various and sundry things are now coming into the building that were not necessarily envisioned in the original design. So we're going to talk now about how that affects us in a building with a low uh, air exchange rate. So our next slide is uh, an eye. And the eye is one of the more sensitive organs of the body to what we call VOCs, or volatile organic compounds. Now, volatile organic compounds can be any number of different uh, chemical compounds. Uh, what distinguishes them is that at room temperature, they tend to go from a liquid or solid state into a vapor state. So it can be things like uh, toluene. It can be things like alcohol, uh, things like the um, um, back in the day, uh, teenagers used to buy whiteout because they could get high on it um, from the toluene in uh, whiteout. So volatile organic compounds can be any number of different kinds of compounds. Now, why the eye is a sensitive organ for that um, to volatile organic compounds is that every time we blink, we are redistributing a lipid layer across um, the uh, cornea of the eye. And that tear fluid is what brings oxygen uh, and cleanses the eye and redistributes uh, lysozyme and other uh, enzymes, which is what keeps the eye uh, safe from external uh, things that, that could potentially uh, affect it. So um, work that was done um, by uh, Malov and, uh, and other uh, European researchers, uh, including Oli Fanger, is that they had volunteers sitting at um, workstations working on the computers, and then they introduced low concentrations of volatile organic com compounds into the air, and then they had special ophthalmic um, uh, equipment. So they were actually watching the fact that as the VOCs increased in concentration, the tear film breakup was faster. In other words, people uh, is that as they uh, blinked, they weren't um, the effect of that clean fluid, tear fluid across the uh, eye was not lasting as long. It was breaking up sooner. Now, one of the first things that we often see in an indoor air quality investigation is people complaining about dry, irritated, itchy eyes. So it's a combination event that not only is it a possibility that VOCs are directly uh, influencing the eye, but we also know from a straight physiologic point of view, when we're using computers, we don't blink as often. That's just a fact that happens. So now we've got a combination of the possibility of VOCs in the office space. We're staring at our computers, so we're not blinking as often. And if the relative humidity is uh, getting on the lower side, which it often does in, in uh, office buildings, you've got the problem of dry, itchy eyes, right? It just makes sense. And then if you've got people that wear contact lenses, of course, it's just exacerbated. Okay, next slide. 
Okay. Now, the other aspect, uh, again, this is human physiology that's, uh, that's interacting with the environment, is that we have, now the uh, illustration is showing uh, a cutaway of a human head. You can see a nose and a, a mouth. Uh, I hate these cutaways, but they work. Um, and it's showing the uh, orange arrow is pointing towards the lower arm of the trigeminal nerve. And that is the nerve that innervates the tongue. And the tongue determines taste, right? Salty, sweet, um, bitter, unami. Next slide. The middle, or sorry, the, the upper arm of the trigeminal nerve enervates the nose. And that's what we call, you know, being able to um, detect odors. And, uh, in, uh, and then the next slide, sorry, is uh, pointing at the middle arm, which is a chemosensory nerve. It does not detect odors. It detects irritation. Now, what's interesting is that humans are actually very bad at being able to identify odors if they don't see what the substance actually is. So that combination of smelling something and not recognizing it and this, this third um, uh, nerve, which reacts to things like formaldehyde or other VOCs that are just irritants, sets up, again, um, a, um, um, a stress response because the body is trying to identify what these potential um, uh, compounds are. Now, interesting, simply because we're talking about uh, COVID at the moment, is that one of the early signs of having a COVID or a SARS-CoV-2 um, um, infection is people lose their sense of smell. And uh, so now you might see that if you're inhaling something and you've got um, virus that are, that are attaching onto that op uh, um, nerve that innervates the, uh, the nose, uh, this may account for that early detection of uh, loss of smell which is kind of interesting. Okay, next slide. Okay, so we tend to think of, um, um, we tend to underestimate how many chemicals there are in all of the things that are in our world. Now, so that's, that's part of the um, uh, picture. The other part of the picture is there are very few of these chemicals that actually have been tested for safety. Um, I, as I mentioned, I'm an occupational hygienist. We have this handy dandy book called um, the uh, uh, Threshold uh, Limit Values, which gives us industrial um, guidance for exposure that most workers can be exposed to a certain level of uh, compound in air over a working life. And we hope that they don't get cancer because then everything's off because cancer uh, causing agents don't have thresholds often. But we have in an occupational setting, when you think about factory floors and things like that, we have guidance. You know, we can look it up. Toluene has X parts per million that a person can be exposed to on a daily basis and survive one way or the other. When we talk about the kinds of exposures that we're talking about in indoor air quality um, settings, like office buildings, like community centers, homes, any of those non-industrial settings, we're not talking about single agents. And that is so important. They're never, it's very, very seldom that it's ever going to be a single agent that is um, uh, the potential uh, problem in uh, people experiencing bad, what they call bad indoor air quality. So these are just examples. Paint has styrene, toluene, uh, trichloroethylene, methylene chloride in it. Even, even the, um, uh, the low VOC emitting paints will have some uh, off-gassing to them. Uh, bringing in new carpets or new flooring, uh, formaldehyde, benzene, toluene, xylenes, 
um, perfumes and uh, scents that people put on themselves. Uh, this is one of the um, one of the things that um, probably caused more office uh, disputes than I can think of nearly anyone else is if you were in that open plan office and you're sitting next to a person that has uh, put quite a bit of perfume on that day and they can't smell it anymore, right? They, they get habituated to it, but everyone around them is picking up on the alcohols and uh, formaldehyde and uh, various and sundry VOCs that they're, they're spewing out. Now, of course, luckily, we don't have smoking anymore in, in, inside buildings, which is wonderful. I'm old enough to remember when that, you know, we used to have smoking uh, and the, the number of things that were in the air at that point in time. But um, vaping is uh, pretty similar. Um, it doesn't have the uh, uh, carcinogens that smoking does, but we now know that, of course, vaping uh, has other things that can also harm the lungs. So next slide. So the other thing that can be brought in to buildings that we, if we're not diluting, if we're not finding a way to uh, bring in clean air or filtered air into the building, um, we have very small particulate matter like um, antigens. Um, um, one of the interesting studies that was done at one point was in a pediatric clinic where children waiting in the pediatric clinic, if they were allergic to cats, were starting to react. They were starting to exhibit the asthma or the, the, the symptom of uh, the cat allergy. And there was no cat anywhere around. But people who own cats, and I have to confess, I own a cat. I'm one of the guilty parties is that wherever I go, I am bringing cat allergen with me and depositing it on the space. So that's just a warning. If you ever come to visit me at UBC, when we go back, um, there's cat allergen <laughs> in, my, uh, in my office. Um, during pollen season, of course, um, pollen can come in very easily uh, depending on the, uh, the size of the, um, uh, or efficiency rather, of the, uh, the filtration of the, the building. And some buildings don't have very good uh, filtration. Um, that little pig pen is uh, a, a, a cartoon from um, uh, Charlie, uh, the, from the Charlie Brown uh, series is illustrating that we are always shedding skin cells. And on each skin cell is a little raft of uh, bacteria. Now the bacteria are not um, pathogenic. Those bacteria are comm called commensal bacteria. In fact, they are what keep our skin healthy. But they, they do have chemical constituents, peptidoglycan and um, other chemical constituents, that if you have low airflow, will be perceived as stale, smelly uh, air. And so just people will contribute to that feeling of um, stale air. And then uh, that uh, uh, lower right-hand um, illustration are fungal spores. And so, of course, that's a whole other concept, is that if you've got water damage, which could potentially be a leak under the kitchen sink in a building, or uh, could be catastrophic uh, building envelope uh, failure, uh, if you've got uh, mold and fungi that are grow growing in the building, those little tiny spores that are about three microns uh, very easily uh, move with air currents in the, uh, in the space. And so very, very happily uh, distribute themselves through the space. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's use this information and apply it to what we know about uh, our different uh, certifications. So next slide. So the LEED building um, has two potential points that you can get um, for indoor air quality considerations. And those points are obtained before, are typically are obtained before the building is ever occupied. And so that is if you um, flush the building, heat the building and flush the building before occupancy, you get your points. And then of course, 
you know, as we already mentioned, people move into the building with their stuff, right? And so it's never tested again. Um, or uh, there's also potential points that can be uh, gained from measuring things um, and their uh, criterion pollutants are particulate matter, ozone, carbon monoxide, and formaldehyde. And those are the only um, criterion that uh, LEED uses to determine good uh, indoor air quality. So particulates, we already mentioned, can come from people, machines, various and sundry things. Um, ozone can come from um, office equipment. Carbon monoxide can come from underground park, parking lots, things like that. And formaldehyde can come from any wood or wood product, uh, furniture and things like that. Next slide. The Bomba Best um, has potential for three, um, uh, four credits of indoor air quality. Um, so one is a credit given during the planning stage consideration. Uh, one credit is given for having ventilation, um, credit for avoiding VOC in the products that you bring in and uh, or limiting VOC emissions. So again, it's um, a lot of it's front end loaded and not so much what happens when uh, occupants move in. Next slide. So the building uh, with the Bomba uh, best, there, here are the criterion uh, for particulate matter, ozone. They, they're actually giving uh, some uh, numbers that can be used as a direct um, uh, measurement that we can go in and look at these. And so you'll see that radon now uh, is included on this list, and we can actually measure uh, the potential for uh, these uh, pollutants. Next slide. Okay, so pass, uh, passive house design is uh, is the big um, big one in the news right now. It's very exciting. Uh, it's and it's entirely to do with energy conservation. They really don't. There's no indoor air quality consideration with passive house. So. Um, it's a it's measured if you um, are uh, qualify under passive house, you uh, reduce the amount of uh, heat that's required to heat the building. Um, it's uh, you have a very very low airflow, a 0 0.6 air changes per hour, and um, and then your your total energy demand um, uh, is related to uh, that um, uh, those criterion. So this is uh, a very exciting new concept that scares the heck out of me uh, as an occupational hygienist, because um, that is a really, really low air exchange rate. Uh, but we don't have very many, we haven't been able to evaluate very many um, passive house designs that are actually uh, in use at the moment. So I would say stay tuned. I think it's gonna be a very interesting story. So let's uh, wrap it up so that you can ask some questions. So in conclusion, next slide. Um, the considerations for good indoor environmental quality has to be made at the time that the building is designed. Um, next slide. Uh, and so it's not only the choices that are made at the construction um, stage, which is where you, a lead, for example, gets their points, but uh, those choices also have to um, um, work their way all the way through the entire life of the building. So occupancy logistics, the number of people that you squish into those open plan offices are going to affect um, the, your ventilation uh, efficiency. This is why we're all now sitting at home because there was no way we could ventilate ourselves out of the potential for COVID um, exposure, uh, for example. Ventilation is absolutely the key to controlling emissions um, and understanding how the ventilation works. Uh, for example, I've seen so many cases where uh, people have brought in fans, individual fans to put out on their desk to, uh, partic you know, to, to cool themselves off. But the fan is pointing in the direction of what the low flow um, um, displacement ventilation 
is trying to is trying to bring air in and so negate everything you know uh, completely mess up the uh, uh, the airflow and then our last is that your local safety and health teams uh, really need to keep indoor air quality on their uh, agenda and it's uh, tricky because it's um, the, the symptoms that people get from poor indoor air quality can range all the way from having colds all the time uh, to having itchy, dry eyes. And we often don't think of itchy, dry eyes as being a health hazard. But if you're trying to do your work on an eight hour day, itchy, dry eyes do uh, affect your productivity and your comfort in a building. So I think my last slide is uh, the things that I wasn't able to talk about today, um, but that um, I've been involved in doing some studies on, um, include uh, consideration of the acoustics, light, ergonomics, and social capital uh, in, the, um, in building design. So the building, I hope you can take away uh, from this talk that the building is almost like a living thing. Occupants in the building are, um, you can't separate one from the other. And that's why sometimes the evaluation of indoor air quality is as complicated as it is, is because we try to simplify it and it can't be simplified. It is part and parcel of a holistic design. I'm gonna stop there and invite questions. So these appendices are just um, yeah, interesting uh, supplemental information. Yeah. You want me to, to forward the slides, Karen? Uh, sure, absolutely. Okay. They're, they're, they are, it, it is an interesting information. It just, it, there wasn't time to talk about it today. Okay. Thanks so much, Karen. That was a great presentation. Um, so for those of you who have questions, please put them into the chat box. Um, there's a tab that looks like a, bubble, a speech bubble. That's where you can enter your questions for Karen. And these slides will be posted on the NCCH website as, uh, uh, along with the webinar recording. Great, lovely. Great, thank you so much everyone. Okay. And uh, if there are no questions, um, I guess we'll wrap it up. And if there are further questions later on after the webinar, please feel free to email me and I will forward them to Karen. And thank you so much everyone and stay, stay well, keep well and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.